Um, what are the different aspects of, of a project? Nobody can think of one? <laughs> Fairly obvious, the rocket. Okay. We can also talk in general. It doesn't have to be just Apollo. You need a goal. Okay, you need a goal. One of the things people say about uh, Apollo is that it had the, the most succinct mission statement of any project that included its own schedule. <coughs> Send a man to the moon and return him safely to the Earth by the, before this decade is out. Right? We should all be so lucky that our projects have such clear. Most of them have 200-page uh, requirements documents. that uh, So schedule. Although decade was ambiguous. Yes, decade was a little bit ambiguous. And, yep. Okay. Non trivial part. Okay. Who's going to do it? Politics. Okay. What for? Uh, as far as locations of facilities and okay. fire sources. And, uh, you know, giving you the this. It's the famous phrase that no bucks, no buck rogers. Um, Those are like milestones or stepping stones along the way of the final goal. Okay, that's a good one. Leaders. Okay. Leadership, good one. Oh, good one. Public support. Okay. Something that really started to wane in the final days of, of before the, the first, uh, before Apollo 11. Okay. Sometimes called the unkongs or the unknown unknowns or known unknowns. Okay. There was, you know, on this topic, not a lot of concern about environmental impact on Apollo, which is, again, one of the things that makes it different from most of the projects we're involved in today. On this side, if you go down to Stennis Space Center, which is one of the less commonly known NASA centers, it's where the, the big test stands are for the rockets in Mississippi. Um, you know, they went in there, this was just before Apollo, but not very long before, and they just took eminent domain, they took over this huge chunk of Mississippi, it's some significant fraction of the state, and all these people were living there on farms and they just moved them out. They said, you gotta live, you can live anywhere around this border. A lot of them still live there and, you know, push people off their land and that was the end of it. Uh, wouldn't happen that way today in the same way. What else? And, and it should be said, by the way, um, really interesting stories in a lot of the centers around this, okay? Where the rockets built, Huntsville, Alabama, okay, during the 1960s. Um, what's happening in Alabama in the 1960s, especially the early 1960s, civil rights movement? Um, not, I mean, almost literally down the road, not in the same city in Huntsville so much, but in Decatur and Montgomery and Birmingham, Alabama. Um, so you have this very kind of forward-looking technological project in one city, and then right down the road there are um, riots and struggles for social change and these things were not unconnected to each other. Um, what other parts of a project might there be? Okay. Uh, good. Sorry? 
Context. Okay, how so? In terms of like historical context. Okay. Certainly, when we think about it after it's happened, we think about what else was going on at the time, why can we see this? Um, you know, and this is something that's notable for being hard for people to see while it's going on. And, um, you know, to many people would have said, especially engineers thinking, well, it was the next logical thing to do to go to the moon. Um, now, with 50 years of hindsight, you can say, gee, there was all these special things that made it happen at that time then. Very hard to make it happen again. And um, what else? Competition in the case of Apollo. Okay, good. Competition. Nobody said the M word yet, which I think is interesting. No? Huh? No? Management? Management. Yeah, there you go. Um, what else? Interestingly, on the, uh, the, like the manpower story, the Cox and Murray chapter that was assigned for today opens with the story about Owen Maynard and the Canadian engineers coming down from uh, Avro in Canada. Um, you know, probably the project could have been done without them, but boy, when you're starting up a team, the ability to get however many it was, 20 or 25, I think, um, uh, experienced aerospace engineers just plunked in was, was a great advantage. Um, by the way, I think Owen Maynard wrote a book about his experience, and when if people are looking for book reviews or you want to know more about that story, still to this day, the Avro Arrow is like, this painful point. Anybody here Canadian? Um, of, in Canadian aerospace history because they didn't just cancel the project, they took the prototypes, they chopped them up and they stuck them out in Lake Ontario. And, um, uh, and it's sort of a big deal. So there's those kind of connections. In fact, one of my students has been working on a dissertation on the international aspects of the space program in the 60s. And, you know, there are all these international aspects that you don't even think about, like the Canadian engineers, the German <coughs> rocket engineers. The Soviet competition is the obvious one. A lot of other places where other engineers and other technologies coming into the U.S. to start the project. What other aspects of a project might be interesting? We talked about knowledge, but I think it's useful to distinguish between sort of theoretical knowledge and applied knowledge. Okay. Um, I don't know if applied knowledge is <coughs> Okay, good. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes people call that tacit knowledge, um, although it's also just industrial knowledge. In fact, the, I think it's even for next week, there's a really good article by Phil Scranton about um, manufacturing behind all of the space capsules in the 60s, including Apollo. Because were these things made with the most advanced manufacturing techniques? Were they mass produced on production lines? No, they, they were basically made like pieces of jewelry, right? Handmade by very skilled workers, one at a time, um, with a lot of rework and a lot of redoing. Nothing like the Model T Ford or the way a, even a, a 707 was coming off a production line by that point in time. So um, they're advanced materials, advanced designs, but the production was pretty much 18th century style. Um, so some would say it still is for spacecraft. Um, what other aspects of a project? Uh, documentation. Okay, good. And that's actually intimately related to this one. Um, and I think I mentioned it last time. A lot of people felt they were swimming in paperwork for this. But one of the innovations, and we'll talk about this next week, in systems management was you got to define all the interfaces really carefully. And on the one hand, that seems like a lot of paperwork. On the other hand, if you take the computer out of it, they were really building virtual models of the spacecraft on paper before they built the spacecraft. That's what you know systems engineering in some way amounted to. And um, it makes it sort of nice for the historian because there's a lot of paperwork to study. Of course, there was a huge amount to wade through and Nobody can go through all of it. Um, so documentation is a big one. 
uh, it's worth thinking a little bit about what kinds of documentation gets spun off from a project like this. What sort of paper lands on the ground while this is happening? Some of those have, I guess, uh, budgetary stuff. So okay. And then uh, I guess some of the technical drawings and stuff I actually use. And then I think uh, the communications between uh, the contractors, uh, because obviously they have to go as far as they can put together. Uh, and then, like, I guess as they turn out to the public, technical reports. Okay, good. Keep, we can keep going. We can go for an hour on this topic. Yeah. Everything that's on the board in paper form. You've got everything from memos to blueprints, schedules. And yep, schedules, blueprints, memos, um, team lists, team lists uh, training schedules. Um, you know, I was able to find the training schedules for the simulators so you could figure out exactly how much time each one of the crew members spent in the simulator. Um, but also stuff like diaries, you know, individual engineers may have kept their own diaries. Um, every, we'll show you some of these, the press pockets that were handed out to the press for given events, you know, which are, um, on the one hand, they're polished PR and they don't give you a lot of nitty gritty detail onto what's really going on. But on the other hand, they're pretty informative just about how the basic system, and interestingly, even though it was one of the readings, nobody mentioned just the public relations part of it. Um, and all of that, which was, again, a huge part, and we'll have a whole session on that from a participant, but um, how do you communicate? I mean, it's going to take us a good part of the semester just to communicate to engineering students what the components of the system were and how all these things connected together. I remember as a kid, you know, trying to understand, gee, how did the lunar module end up on the front of the capsule? you know, for the flight. I never really got that part till, till later when I realized they pull it out and they turn around and they pull it out. Try explaining that to a reporter. Um, today, there are actually reporters who specialize in technology. Back then, there were one or two science reporters. Vic McElhaney was one of them, but most of the rest of them were assigned from the, you know, the city crime sheet to cover the space program, and that's pretty much where you were starting. Um, with a complex project, that's not such an easy thing to do. What, else, what other things can we think of as part of the project? A plan. Sorry? A plan. Okay, a plan. Um, that's an interesting one, not unrelated to schedule and money, um, and probably more accurate to say plans. Um, you're sort of hard pressed to say there's any one plan for the Apollo program, but there were a number of them at different points. Um, it's very interesting to read the really early ones to see what they thought they were going to do. And um, one of the things I did when I was writing the book was um, in about 1960 or 61, they went out to seven different aerospace contractors and says, write us a proposal for getting to the moon. And they did. And in those seven different proposals, you can see all this variation in I was particularly interested in what they thought the pilots were going to do. And they had every variation from, you know, one pilot with a computerized tape landing to five guys in the, in the, in the spacecraft landing. And shows you the, the design space in a way. It's very easy for us, so used to seeing the images of Apollo, to think it was logical that they did it in this way. But they had a lot of choices. Anybody didn't know why there were three people on board? Uh, pretty close. Mostly that that was what commercial airliners had on board. Um, it seemed like a logical one. There was never any real spec given for why they needed. Um, once they did that, it's, and we'll see this in the LOR decision, it made sense for one person to wait uh, in orbit and two, two people to walk around. But the nearest I could ever nail it down to was that was what commercial uh, aircraft were flying, um, which is interesting because they don't fly that anymore. Um, Okay, we've done a pretty good job here of this list. Anything, anybody want to add to anything? Um, you know, another part is, is very fuzzy but very important word that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people is just culture. Um, Apollo had a kind of project culture. Each of the local places it was done had a, a different local culture around it. We'll hear a lot about the, the culture here at MIT, um, although it's also always interesting about um, 
what was the name of the group at MIT that, that built the computers? Anybody know? The MIT Instrumentation Lab, which by the end of the Apollo program wasn't even part of MIT anymore. MIT spun it out in 1971 or two to be um, what is now the Draper Lab. And um, NASA always referred to it just as MIT, as though the entire institution was making the computer. We'll go ask MIT, this guy's from MIT, even after it was spun out. Um, but there's both the culture of the project, there's the culture of um, the individual places within the project, and then all the cultures of the local places where those things happen. I mentioned a little bit about Alabama, Mississippi, California, um, trying to bring all those people together um, uh, wasn't trivial. And then we talked also about the larger sort of three major engineering cultures, the ICBM culture, the NACA flight test culture, and the Huntsville rocket building culture, and how they all had to come together. And there's a good case to be made that that was the key issue in the project. And once you got that figured out, you were sort of good to go. Anything else? And, and then the, there's the culture of the representation of MTV and astronauts. And you can't watch too much. If you ever watch movies from the 60s, they almost always have something about the space program. And it was very much on people's minds. What I want to do now um, is, of all the different ways to think about the project, I want to kind of lay out the simplest and the crudest one, which is just chronology. Um, and talk a little bit about what happened when. Because, as I said last time, we don't teach this course. Suspense is not a very good teaching tool. Um, and we want to look at the project overall from the beginning. We'll go through it sort of chronologically with some of the next few classes. But we're going to always talk about the whole thing. And, and um, I'm not going to surprise you by the end about whether Apollo 11 landed successfully or not. Um, although it's very important to remember, nobody in the project had any idea whether it was going to be successful until not really that moment, but the moment they came home. And so, you know, they were not working on the greatest space program that ever happened or anything like that. They were working on this thing that could either be the biggest, most expensive failure ever, or it could be a success and nobody really knew what kind of success was. And that question is very much on people's minds, even after Apollo 11, obviously. Um, and you, you know, there's, there's a sense where um, it's always a question to ask, what defines success? Who gets to define it? When does it get defined? Does it get defined? And how does it change? How do people's assessment of it change over time? Um, Apollo was successful in meeting its goal. Um, over the term, we'll talk about how successful was it in laying a foundation for human space exploration. Um, so I just want to decide whether I want to put it all up on here. Let's see if we can get it all on here um, and make a little chronology. And um, so let's see. Uh, I'll end in 1975, and then I'll sort of go see if this spaces me well enough. And even by choosing these boundaries, I'm already putting an artificial boundary around the project. Because as you'll see, a lot of important things about it started a long time before this. And many of them went afterward. But just to pick a set of dates, why did I start with 1957? Anybody remember the exact date? Good. 10-4-57. Why did I end with uh, 65 or 75? Apollo Soyuz. Apollo Soyuz. 
close. Skylab's close. So the Apollo Soyuz test project was the official name of it. Um, and Skylab was launched in 73. Okay, so that gives us some rough orientation. Um, anybody want to add some dates? Sorry? Okay, good. What's the date? Okay, so 7 20 69. That's what we read about last time. That's a pretty good date. Interestingly, um, so they made the end of the decade, depending on how you define it, you know, they had a good few months to spare. Um, in fact, Apollo 12 was already flown by the end of the decade. It was December of 69. Um, anything else? Okay, good. 1958 is NASA being created. So pretty new agency, not a lot of time there. Seventy two when the program was canceled. Okay. Um, when was it actually canceled? Yeah, it must have been seventy two. Um, Was it earlier than that, John? Do you remember? Uh, the, the, well, the last <laughs> two flights were in '72, September of 1970, after Apollo 13. Right, '70. So it was actually '70 when it was canceled. They actually stopped making the Saturns. The decision to stop the production line was 1968. Before okay, when they were already made, or they were already enough to, to get through the project. Anything else? I don't know if it ties in directly to this timeline, but the JFK assassination. Good. What's the date on that? Yep. No, that's very relevant, actually. 112263. I forgot to put what it is. And there's that, we saw the photograph, that moment from him touring Cape Canaveral the week before he died. So you have this kind of little historical juxtaposition of the, the Cape being built and Kennedy's assassination. The Apollo 1 command module. Okay, good. Was that 67? Mm hmm Anybody know when? January 67. What was the actual date? Um, That, that's interesting because all three of the NASA's fatal manned spaceflight accidents happened in the last week of January uh, or February 1st uh, within, within that. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, okay, good. Um, just trying to get my scaling right here. <coughs> What happened on Christmas Eve, 1968? Apollo 8, right. I mean, it was the whole two weeks, but the notable part of it for people was. Uh, 1961. Okay. Um, Gagarin, and then I think Shepard was also the same year. Okay, good. And anything else? So 61's a big one. Um, when was Gagarin? Anybody know? April. April 12th. Shepard. I think it's like a month later. 5 5. 
which is Mercury 1. What else happens in May of 61? JFK speech. Okay, Kennedy speech. Um, that's the 25th. What happens on January 20th, 1961? Kennedy's inaugurated, right? So, pretty young presidency. What also happens in April of 61, speaking of the young presidency? Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, We'll look at this in more detail when we go th through this part of it, but pretty eventful few months there. And, you know, he's only been in office for four months, but he had a couple of pretty rough weeks and months there and then came out with this big announcement. Good, good political strategy to distract from your defeats. Um, and what's also interesting, when did John Glenn orbit the Earth? Which in some way is the early space accomplishment that more people remember. After the JFK speech? Yeah, it was uh, February of 62. So pretty big bet, given that we had one suborbital shot. Shepard was in space for what? five minutes out of a 15 minute flight. Um, you know, pretty modest accomplishment. And then say we're going to the moon. Um, again, the question he asked his guys, what promises dramatic results that we could win? And part of that was the kind of leapfrog strategy of, well, the Soviets can probably do this and that and they can do that. Um, but if we, if we just skip three steps, maybe we'll get there. What else? 1970, Apollo 13. Okay, good. Also January, right? Um, That's April. Sorry? April. Oh, April, right. I think um, I'm not exactly sure, but it's January 69, was April not one. Uh, okay, good one. Good international context there. What else? It was like a 57. Uh, uh, yep. What was the month on that? Do you remember? Uh, it was, I think it was just a couple weeks later. Hmm? Still October. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, minor issue there. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of ways you can date that. I actually wrote a couple of them down. Um, 65, Johnson orders the bombing of North Vietnam, which is a big escalation. Um, I mean, it's a sort of constant, gradual rising up through here. Tet Offensive 1968, which was really the first time that people realized maybe it really isn't going all that well. Um, Johnson. Does Nixon beat Johnson in the 1968 election? What happens? Johnson with Charles. Johnson says, I'm not going to run. He's that politically weakened. Um, anything else? Arguably, there's a relationship between drawing down of spending on the space program and the drawing down of troops and spending in 
well. 70 to 72 and then 72 to 75, which is a Vietnamization. Yeah, holiday. certainly there's a lot of budgetary pressure during this period um, from the war and, uh, and Republican administration comes in, doesn't like a big Democratic project running. Um, what is, when Ed Mitchell was here, we were talking about this at dinner. And we, you were probably both there, John and, and Larry. And we said, somebody said, well, so do you think it was more, do you think Nixon canceled the program because <coughs> he figured it was a success and he didn't want to risk maybe having a failure and ta tainting the program? or? Because it, uh, it was a uh, Kennedy project, and he didn't want to be associated with the Kennedy project. And, and Ed said, "Well, I actually met with Nixon and talked it over with him twice during that period, and it was definitely the latter." <laughs> um, let's look at some of the early chronology, because um, there's some things that are a little bit surprising in here. One of the interesting ones in this eventful period of 1961 is um, uh, August of 61 is the Apollo guidance computer, wasn't even the computer, it was just the guidance system. The contract is let to, for MIT. And what's interesting about that is that it's, what, only three months after Kennedy's speech. And it is the first contract let in the entire program. Um, and North American, um, who built the command module, which at the time was considered the whole thing, is um, um, not until November of 61. Um, and then you have to go through the whole LOR decision, um, which happens during that year, and it's only November of the following year that Grumman is chosen um, to build the LEM. So that, that's interesting chronology because that really shapes a lot of what happens in the first few years. The computer ends up having to go in two spacecraft. Um, it's not clear they were ahead, but it's clear why Grumman was behind sort of for the whole program. Because when the program started, nobody thought they were going to need um, uh, a lunar module. Um, the feasibility studies that I mentioned, which are interesting to read, is in here. So um, these were when the contracts were let. I think they had reported out already by the next spring. But again, it tells you Kennedy wasn't jumping into the unknown, right? He, was, he wasn't an idiot. He had talked to his people. NASA had done enough work to go, we'd like a little more time than the end of the decade. Um, in fact, I think the original Kennedy goal was, was the end of his term, which was going to be 1968. But they convinced him to give him another couple of years. Um, but they basically knew that they had the technology in hand. They didn't know, obviously, everything that was involved. But they had let these feasibility studies and done a whole lot of internal work to figure that out. Um, interestingly, the first flight of the Saturn I is also really early, 10 of 61. So the, the basic rocket is pretty well underway also. They're not dealing with vaporware in some sense. They had a sense that at least at the more modest scale, not the Saturn V, they could, they could get something to fly. Um, the uh, Any any other ones you know, or questions? How does Gemini there? play into all of this? Okay, good question. If they already had like, um, the Saturn one and they had the contracts and like they were contracting for the LEM like as early as like sixty one and sixty. Yeah, 
Really good question. So let's, let's put some of that timeline on here. So the Mercury flights are, um, as we said, May of 61, Shepard is the first one, through May of 63. Call it that. And there are six of them. Who didn't fly? Deke Slayton didn't fly. So, um, and I think actually, Grissom was the second one. He flew in the fall of uh, '61. So there were two suborbitals before Glenn flew. Um, and then Gemini is March of '65 through November of '66. Um, There's a, a few things that are interesting about that. Um, uh, one is the LOR decision is made in June of 62. We'll talk a lot about that. Hence the letting of the contract to Grumman that fall. Um, so let's think about this again. We'll come up with it again. But um, Kennedy announces in May it becomes a real project. Um, interestingly, I'll just stick this on here. July of 60, the name Apollo is given to the project a year before the speech. Um, it's sort of underway. The LOR issue comes up, and it's decided the following June, which is a pretty short time scale to how things happen today. They let the contract for the LEM. Um, one of the things that decision does is it gives Gemini a whole mission in life. Because now rendezvous and docking is suddenly this critical component. They had sort of known that, um, but not in as much detail. And so the Gemini program is actually partly retasked orient toward being able to launch from the moon and, and, uh, um, and dock with a with a, another spacecraft uh, from the moon. So um, Gemini plays in that way. Also plays in very, very clearly in the, uh, with, for the MIT folks who were not involved with either of those two programs. They felt like they were operating on a pretty long leash right up to this point. NASA was pretty darn busy up through this period. And much as you can say Mercury and Gemini were kind of logical stepping stones, a lot of people felt that the lessons of those programs were never incorporated into the Apollo program because by the time any real lessons, a little bit more from Gemini, but certainly here, there's not a whole lot you can do to change the Apollo program in 1966. Like contracts are let, design decisions are made, um, a few things get done in a sort of emergency basis, but um, there's not that much to do. It's all being designed, right, before uh, Mercury flies, yeah? I think they learned a lot um, because it was the same people to a large degree. Um, and one of the things you see is those people are busy here. And this is the Chris Craft and the whole, and to some degree, a lot of the space task group, the part who are not designing, are operating. Um, and here, and um, I think the quote um, in 1966 was, it was actually May of 66 that it happened up here, was suddenly like Gemini was done. And NASA started paying attention to us up here. And boy, it really hit the fan then. And this period from May of 66 through, um, actually through the fire, or even a little bit after the fire, is a period of intense turmoil in the relationship between MIT and NASA. Because that's when NASA starts paying attention. Very specifically with one guy named Bill Tyndall, who will read a bunch of his uh, memos and, you know, you interview these guys today, and you can see when they start talking about it, like, it was really hard for them. There was a lot of emotion wrapped up in those meetings. They called them Black Friday meetings. And that was when they really forced them to sort of sit up and say, you know, you're a bunch of long-haired academics. You know, quit messing around with doing things the perfect way. Figure out a way to do it that you can just get it done. Um, and we'll, we'll cover that when we talk about the computer. So 
Gemini is very relevant there. It also is relevant for a lot of reasons, but not so much on the design, spacecraft design side, because again, different contractor altogether. There's no reason that people from McDonnell Douglas would have gone to North American or to Grumman and said, here's what we learned, do it differently this way. Um, maybe that's one of the sources of the fire. Um, <coughs> anything else you want to add? Think about. I have a long list. I won't give you all of them, but see what you guys can come up with first. Okay, good. <coughs> Apollo 17, 1972. Um, December of 72. Um, I'll date myself. That's the only one I remember. Um, and I remember being allowed to stay up late to watch it on TV. Why would I have to stay up late? Because it launched at night. It was the only one that launched at night. Um, and uh, we talked a little bit about Jack Schmidt on that one. And, um, and, and everyone knew it was the last one at the time. Is there a time. specific reason for that? There yeah. is. And it, it had to do with the landing site. So the thing that actually timed the launches was the lighting at the landing sites. So depending on what your latitude was in the place you wanted to go, that said, when you needed to arrive there to get, I'm forgetting exactly, a 30 degree sun angle, an angle that was determined to give you the best relief. Because if you, if you got it at the kind of lunar high noon, it was going to be so bright and there'd be so few shadows that it would all be washed out and you couldn't see anything. If you got it too, too dark, obviously that'd be a problem. And it was really empirically determined that these, this sun angle will give you the best mix of shadows and brightness and plus or minus a couple hours to be early or late. Um, and that was, you back that whole thing through the back, the mission clock, and you, that told you when you needed to uh, take off. And, um, and, but it also indicates a level of confidence, right? Like a night launch, um, you know, anybody here a pilot? Like flying at night is significantly more risky not just, I mean, not least because you just can't see what you're doing as well. And it, there was a sense of, like, we know what we're doing. We can do this. It's, you know, the system is more or less proven. We can, we can do it. So, question over here. Uh, wasn't, I don't know if this is reaching uh, too far into the future, but coincident with Apollo 17 was congressional approval of the space shuttle program? Uh, it was right around then. That's right. John, do you remember exactly when it was shown? What he's referring to is actually when they were on the moon on 16, the Congress voted for it. So okay. that was April of so 17. On 16. So let's put 16 in there, too. Um, so another reason that it's really worth understanding the politics behind Apollo because it's intimately interwoven with the shuttle decision decisions. Same people on the design side, politics very heavily influenced, and that's where we've been for the last 40 years. And so, um, you know, even when I was writing my book, which is about the Apollo control system, um, I didn't expect to write about the shuttle at all, but at the end, you sort of began to see that a lot of the people who had done that design were then doing the shuttle control system. and, and there were a lot of either influences or lessons that people felt they had not learned. Um, you know, the, gr the best quote is from Michael Collins, who said, you know, wings and wheels at last. We would no longer be fished out of the ocean like a bag full of soggy cats. Um, <laughs> that's what the, meant the shuttle meant for the crews. Um, you know, there was something deeply embarrassing to these pilots about landing you know, apparently not in control of the capsule. They did have control of the capsule, but, um, and they wanted to land on a proper runway where they could wear their proper clothes and get out and wave to the crowds. And um, um, So let, let's just put the other flights in because there's a couple interesting things that you see about that. Um, Apollo 1 fire in January of 67. Um, And so maybe I'll try to just draw them over here. Apollo 1, January 67. Um, Apollo 4, November 67. 
um, Apollo 5, January of 68. Where am I missing? Six. Um, six was an unmanned test, is that right? Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. David, I'll, I'll point out since you're on that, but yeah. that launch occurred on the same day Martin Luther Went from being the, the prime news story to. Oh, okay. The, so what was the date? I think it's April 4th. April 67. 67. 68. 68, yeah. Uh, six. Um, Apollo 7, October 68. This is not going to match my line very well. <coughs> there is a point I want to make about it. So I'll do this. Apollo 5, Apollo 6, Apollo 7. Um, Apollo 8 we have already, which is um, December of 68. Um, Apollo 9, actually I don't have that on here, or 10. March and May of 69. March and May of 69. Apollo 9, Apollo 10. Pretty fast, right? Things are happening quick. Um, and then Apollo 11, July of 69. Um, Apollo 12, I'm not going to really get this all lined up. Apollo 12 is December of 70. Then Apollo 13, sorry, December of 69. Apollo 13 is in April of 70. And Apollo 14 is January of 71. Um, and then, uh, whoops, I wrote that wrong. And Apollo 15. July of 71, Apollo 16, April of 72, and Apollo 17 here, which is December of 72. And just a couple things that are worth looking at, which is um, I had actually never appreciated until I, I was writing the book, which is that because of Apollo 13, there's more than a year between Apollo 12 and Apollo 14. Um, so there's a lot of time to go back and look at these two landings as a pair, in a way, um, as the kind of most, uh, uh, you know, kind of evaluate them as a test flight program. And then we mentioned this, I think, last week. These are the so-called J missions. Anybody, what was different about the J missions? They had the rover. They had the rover. That was a huge difference. Generally, greater payload. Um, higher precision um, in the landing, longer stay, um, you know, th three solid days on the moon by the time you get to Apollo 17. Um, and uh, uh, really rather different story in, in some ways. And we'll hear that from Dave Scott, who flew the first one. Um, you know, how long was the stay in Apollo 11? Anybody know? Yeah, actually, I, the, the, the EVA was just about two hours. They went out, they walked around for two hours, they came back, and they went home. Um, here, you're talking about go out, work all day, come home, take the suits off, deal with the dust, go to sleep, get out, work all day the next way, come back. A whole different level as far as scientific data, experience on the moon, ability to traverse, complexity of the mission, complexity of the scientific instrumentation. Um, you know, they're not all sort of equal that way, and that's something that's really worth appreciating. We'll, we'll come across that. Um, you know, and actually, some of the later missions, this was never formally done, but there were studies to do things like, well, gee, why don't we just take the LEM and, and, and fill it with supplies and land three or four of them unmanned in an area, and then um, uh, go up there and we can stay two weeks. Um, and that was all drawn out on paper. Um, including an unmanned limb, which is not something that certain people really wanted to admit happened uh, or was acceptable. Um, interesting, some of these, wh what did Apollo 12 do? It was a pinpoint landing. So Apollo 11, we mentioned it already, was about 
now I'm forgetting, I think it was three miles long, which is pretty long when you're trying to do a visual. You know, it meant that they were in a place they didn't recognize. Apollo 12, they picked an arbitrary spot, which was where Surveyor 3 had landed. And they did so well, they, they landed on the side of the crater that it was in. I got out and they walked over to it, took out a hammer and, and knocked off some pieces for, for sample collection and to study long duration materials issues. Um, pretty impressive, you know, I, I, the, the error was like 600 yards or something, I'm forgetting exactly. Um, and so uh, kind of amping up the requirements for each one. And that's a demo flight then for these later flights to tell you that you can really go into some pretty hairy terrain. Um, then worth just mentioning what characterizes each of these. Um, Apollo 5, uh, sorry, Apollo 4 was the sort of all-up test. We'll talk about that a little bit later of the Saturn V. Um, Apollo 5 is the first test, which is unmanned of the LEM. Um, just get it up there, pressurize it, um, try out all the systems. Um, Apollo 6 was an unmanned, uh, primarily re-entry test, um, which actually had some problems with it. Um, Apollo 7 was the first manned flight. Um, worth noting also, Apollo 1 was not Apollo 1 when the fire happened. It was AS204, I think, um, which was the more managerial codes that they used, and got renamed Apollo 1 as a kind of honorific for, to honor the, the astronauts. Um, Apollo 7 was the first manned test of uh, the command module. Um, also, if you talk about the computer, which we will, this is all Block 1, which never flew manned, and they begin to fly the Block 2 here. Um, Apollo 7 is notable also because the crew had a dispute with the ground controllers over sort of issues related to the command of the mission. Um, Wally Shara, who was one of the Mercury 7, was the commander. And the uh, entire crew then never flew again. Um, so uh, Wal Walter Cunningham, uh, who was the third one on that one? Uh, remember? On Apollo 7? This is all stuff you can look up. Um, Apollo 8 we talked about is the, the, the LEM is running late, so it's not ready. Um, and so they come up with the decision to fly Apollo 8 uh, manned around the moon. Um, Apollo 9 is the first test of the LEM in um, Earth orbit. Um, in fact, Dave Scott is a uh, um, command module pilot on that flight. It's actually really interesting because um, now I used to know all these names and I could remember everybody on every mission. The other two crew members on Apollo 9, <laughs> McDivitt and, uh, and Schweikert, get in the LEM and fly it a bunch of miles away, which is a pretty gutsy thing to do if you think about it, because you can't get home in the LEM. You've got to get back to the command module. So they try out all the, um, all the relative navigation, all the, some of the rendezvous techniques, the basic uh, flight characteristics, flying qualities of the LEM. And um, uh, Dave Scott, left alone in the command module, gets to fly it around by hand a little bit, which he'll talk about, which he really enjoyed. Um, sorry? Third crew, third crew member on Apollo 7 was Don Isley. Isley, yeah. Um, first astronaut to get divorced. Um, <laughs> and uh, then Apollo 10 um, goes all the way to the moon and goes right down up to the point that we started watching the movie the other day to PDI, which is a 10 mile high orbit around the moon, which is also an interesting set of conversations because the, the, the sort of discussion was once you get there, you've taken on 90% of the risk of the mission. Why would you just wait there and not go all the way down? And um, it, was, it was talked through quite a bit. Um, and, but they came back. They almost lost control of the LEM as it was docking during that flight. Also an interesting episode. 
Um, and then, of course, Apollo 11, which no one was at all sure they were going to be able to land then. And there was a policy, I think it comes up in the Cox and Murray book, that if you were on a mission that had to abort, you would get another mission. So, because they didn't want the crews to take unnecessary risks just because they thought it might be their last chance. Um, that said, Armstrong has a great quote about Apollo 11, which I love. He says, when you're, simulate, when you're training in the simulator, you're spring-loaded to the abort position, meaning you'd always be, you know, it was always about what do you abort. When you're landing, you're spring-loaded to the land position when you're really there. So he was going to keep going no matter what through those program alarms. Um, so that's the, the only other thing here would be um, there's a bunch of other details we can stick in, um, which is September 62. Is the new nine? Anybody know what that means? The second group of, of astronauts uh, is chosen. Um, I'm actually forgetting when the Mercury Seven were chosen. Do you remember offhand, John? It's April fifty-nine. April fifty-nine. Um, so the new nine. Um, September of 62, who are really the bunch who mostly are the uh, fly to the moon. How many of the Mercury 7 astronauts flew to the moon? <coughs> one. Alan Shepard is the only one. Um, th at least three are involved in the program. Grissom dies in the Apollo 1 fire and um, as uh, Shara is commander of Apollo 7. Um, so the new nine are chosen in, in 62. Um, I go through this a little bit in the book. They, they actually are very differently qualified from these guys. Um, why were these guys chosen primarily? What were the criteria for the Mercury 7? That was not the first criteria, actually. They were mostly chosen as physical specimens, you know, um, and, and actually they weren't all experimental test pilots. Not all of them had graduated from college. I think only one of them was an engineer. Um, of these guys, they're all experimental test pilots. This is as opposed to pilots who fly, you know, who test munitions or who fly at the end of a production line. Um, I believe they're all experimental test pilots They're doing research. Um, I think they're all engineers in this group. And then the, the next group is the 14, which I didn't even put on my notes. Um, and uh, they are, uh, a lot of them are even yet higher educated. A bunch of them have PhDs. These tend to be the, the guys who are in the left seat in the LEM. And the, the, of the 14 tend to be the, the ones who are more junior in the right seat, which is interesting because on almost every landing, the, the guy in the right seat has a higher level of technical education than the guy in the left seat does. Um, and then in, in uh, 65, um, they select the scientist astronauts, six of them. including um, Jack Schmidt, who we mentioned, including Larry's classmate from Bob Parker, who came a couple of years ago. Oh, and Gary. Oh, and Gary. A lot of them are Skylab, end up flying in, in the Skylab era. Um, so it, it's interesting to just look at the different kind of demographics as that moves forward. Yeah. Were there changes in the actual Saturn V rocket, which enabled the J-missions to bring a lot more payload, or was they, were they just more comfortable with their margins? Uh, I think it was mostly about being more comfortable with the margins and um, actually improving the trajectories in ways that bought you, you know, if, if you refined the, the, the burns, you could buy yourself hundreds of pounds of fuel in ways that um, would say, would, you know, allow you to do a lot. On the, one of them was um, uh, 
in the early missions, the command module, I'm forgetting exactly, it was in like a 60 mile orbit. And the, the LEM would separate from it and then burn itself down to the 10 mile orbit before the PDI. And on the J missions, the, the, the command module dived right down to 10 miles and sort of brought the LEM with it. So the LEM didn't have to burn its own fuel to, to, to make that first burn. And then it could be more lightly loaded with fuel and more heavily loaded with other stuff. Um, there was, it was, I don't think it was any one thing, but it was a whole series of things. Do you, are, are there others you remember, John? Basically, right. I mean, um, they limited some of the motors on the Saturn that picked up some uh, benefit on performance also. I mean, the command module also had a lot more. There was a lot more science being done on these missions from lunar orbit. Um, that with a lot of instrumentation that wasn't even there. In fact, uh, um, there's a great picture I'll show you. I was showing it to my daughter last night because I was telling her, that's Dave Scott. He's going to come over for dinner. And um, <laughs> she, said, she said, that's good, Daddy, because when I grow up, my job is going to be a space lady, and I have to know what I need to do. She's four. <laughs> um, I was like, all right, you win the prize. Um, uh, but they actually, after, at the end of the mission, when the Lem came back, they actually climbed out of the command module, did a spacewalk, went out and got the film and the other data canisters and brought them back. Um, uh, so, um, okay, that's a pretty good snapshot of the chronology. Um, I just want you to have this sense of what's going on and especially how quickly things happen during this sort of two or three year period. And it's practically month by month, if you were in this business, that things were changing in a pretty radical way. Um, and we haven't said as much about what's going on in the country, but you know, this is the 60s, right? So um, Vietnam, civil rights, especially in the early period, a lot of civil unrest for a lot of different reasons, um, and a lot of cultural change, a lot of social change all going on. Now, there are some people who say, the Apollo program was really kind of a 1950s project that just kind of extended into the 60s. Because if you look at all the guys in Apollo by the late 60s, they all still have crew cuts. And nobody's wearing crew cuts by the end of the 60s. Um, and uh, it's also really interesting to think about. And there's been some good books written about. On the one hand, at this time, people, especially young people, felt like the Apollo program represented the, the worst of the old system as far as why are we spending all this money when people are starving, people are dying in Vietnam, um, and you have this enormous military industrial complex. That was a phrase that people started to use during this period. Um, and what are we doing sending people to space? We have so many problems on Earth. Um, and a hippie and an astronaut seemed like the two furthest possible ends of the political spectrum. Um, but in another way, they were both sort of utopian movements and very much of the same kind of period in that they really had uh, sort of dreams of a, of a brighter, kind of more perfect future, dreams that a lot of people in the following decades felt were unrealized and had been kind of let down in. So it's interesting to think about how you can integrate Apollo into the, the, the American history of the 60s um, or not. Um, was there a question? Did I see a question? Or? No, just um, <coughs> referring to the, the uh, Vietnam War, which was escalating during that time, and was expensive. Despite that, you'll, we'll get into the budget issue, but despite that, a relatively enormous part of the Treasury was being used to su support this program. Yeah. The peak, it's actually, I should have drawn this. We'll, we'll show this famous curve. The peak of the funding profile is around 1967 for Apollo, and it's going down here. And it's 3% of the federal budget, um, which is an enormous amount of money. What's NASA today? Anybody know? It's like well less than 1%, it's, which is funny because if you poll the public, they all think it's like 10% of the, the federal budget. But it's, it's a very, very small fraction, whereas this was much, much, much bigger. Um, and um, it's one other thing about that I want to. Oh, the other thing that is really important to keep in mind is that all of these astronauts who are chosen, you know, they're raised in a military culture. Most of them, I mean, they're all pilots, um, or most of them are pilots. 
um, their friends, their colleagues, are in Vietnam fighting a war while all this is going on. Okay? In fact, some of them even say, uh, I think it was Walter Cunningham who says, you know, the day I was selected as an astronaut, I was brought to this fancy hotel in Houston and stayed overnight for the big press conference the next morning. And as I'm getting dressed, I'm looking on the TV, and there's my buddy from college being paraded down the streets of Hanoi as a POW. He had just been shot down. Um, Gene Cernan, there's a film called The Dark Side of the Moon, is that? Or The, f the Far Side of the Moon? The one that we, uh, we screened it here in, uh, with the filmmaker a couple of years ago. Dark Side of the Moon, um, it's a very good film about, that's interviews with a lot of the astronauts, kind of newer interviews. And Gene Cernan says, you know, you got to understand, Vietnam was my war, right? I had gone to school and trained for 10 or 15 years, and that was my generation being called to that war. And instead, at the last minute, I kind of get pulled out and I do this other thing. So there was a lot of sense from them. It's not to say that they didn't think they were doing something important, but when we get into all the things about how central are they to the control systems? How much are they really flying it? That's part of the background. They had this great need to show that they were doing something active and useful, where a lot of them, and, and they talk about this in some of their memoirs, they, were, they received derision from their colleagues for, you know, we're out here fighting a war, putting our lives on the line, and you're, you know, literally holding press conferences and speaking to elementary schools and, and getting all this glory for why. Um, and so that's never too far apart, um, those two things, Vietnam and, and Apollo. 